In this video, we're going to be talking about some of the common disaccharides, polysaccharides, also called carbohydrates, and uh, we're going to be talking about how to recognize what type of glycosidic bonds they entail. So let's take a few examples here. I'm going to start out with maltose. Maltose is actually a disaccharide of two glucose units, and the glucose unit you use in maltose is going to be the alpha D glucose. So if I have two glucose units, they're going to be bonding with one another with the help of an glycosidic bond. So if I have another one here, and let's uh, number these. Um, so this carbon is going to be called 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And uh, very similarly on the second one, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So what really happens, uh, it's a condensation reaction where the two units are going to combine together with a loss of water. So the OH from the first unit, that's going to be coming from the anomeric carbon, and the hydrogen from the second unit, they're going to be combining together to lose the water and then you connect the rest of the molecule. So to make my life easier, I'm just going to copy this down. And then just put it right here. So since I'm running out of the space, I'll just put it right here. And then what I'm going to do, just take out part of it. So take out this bond, this bond as well. And all of a sudden, you're going to have this linkage right there, oxygen there and oxygen there. And this hydrogen was already attached there. So the two units are combining with one another at first and the fourth position. But since uh, this first unit is the one that's containing the anomeric carbon, so this was the anomeric carbon, and since it's pointed down, you're going to be calling this an alpha, because with respect to this the CH2 OH here, and this pointed down, they are being transferred to one another. This is going to be called an alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bond. Okay, and then you still have one end, one anomeric end that's coming, that's going to be coming from the second glucose unit. That's going to be free um, anomer there. That's still going to be making the alpha anomer because the OH is pointed down. And uh, since you have an, a free end here where it's going to have the OR and the OH attached, this call this end is going to be called a reducing end. Another way of saying this is still going to be in a reducing sugar even after making this glycosidic bond. If both of your anomeric carbons are taken up uh, when you're making the bond, that's when it's going to be a problem. That's when it's not going to be in a reducing sugar. If both anomeric carbons are, are making acetyl's bond or are both taken up. Okay, let's take another example. Uh, sucrose is another common one. So sucrose is a combination of an uh, glucose and fructose and uh, it's a little bit interesting when we talk about sucrose because uh, it it's going to be the anomeric carbon that's going to be bonding with one another so if i look at this my, my glucose molecule which is the alpha d glucose here so it's going to be one two three four five and six and then on the bottom you have the beta d, d fructose and it's going to be the second carbon on this uh uh, five-membered furan ring, so it's going to be the second one here, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and obviously this CH2O, which is called the first one. And since in this particular case, it's going to be the anomeric carbons that's going to be bonding with one another, um, that, and it's going to, since both of those anomeric carbons are going to be taken up when you make this uh, uh, disaccharide, it's not going to be in a reducing sugar. So what gonna ha what's going to happen, I'm going to have this... Uh, OH from the glucose and the hydrogen from the fructose here, they're going to be combining together to lose water. And then what's going to be left behind is just the combination of those two. So if I just copy this down, I'll just put it right here. So I'm going to have a bond here that's going to be pointed down with respect to the glucose like this and then I'm going to have the bond that's going to be pointed up with respect to the fructose like this okay so 
you can say it's going to be an alpha with respect to the glucose, but it's actually going to be the beta with respect to the fructose because it's pointed up. And um, since it, there, it's going to be the anomeric carbons bonding one another in both those uh, monomer units, we're going to be calling this alpha, beta, 1 to 2 glycosidic bond. Okay, and clearly, we, why we call this 1 to 2, because it's the first carbon that's coming from the glucose, and it's going to be the second carbon that's going to be coming from the, the fructose, and the second carbon in that particular case is going to be your anomeric carbon. And this particular case, since both of those uh, anomeric carbons are taken up to make the acetals, or uh, none of those uh, anomeric carbons are free, or in the form of so-called an hemiacetal, this is going to be a non-reducing sugar. Okay, let's take another example here. Uh, the lactose is another one where you have the, the you got the beta galactose and the glucose combining together uh, to make disaccharide. And in that particular case, uh, I'm going to be taking the OH from the first position of the galactose, so one two, three, four, five, six. And keep in mind, the galactose and the glucose, they are epimers of one another. There's only going to be a difference in the position at one location. However, this particular one is the beta and this, this uh, glucose is the alpha. And then you're going to have the H coming from the fourth position of glucose. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to taking this OH and this hydrogen is kind of putting them together. And uh, when you put this together, it's clearly going to be making a beta bond here. So let me just copy this down and put it right here. And the way it's going to be positioned after it makes the bond, I can move this uh, up a little bit so that I can have it aligned with the beta bond there. So you still have the hydrogen there and then you're going to have oxygen there and then the, here is your new bond right there so since it's pointed up in this particular case the oxygen here and the CH2OHs they are both cis to one another that's going to be your beta bond so it's going to be the beta 1 to 4 glycosidic bond Okay, and uh, since it's in a beta bond, you need an, a special enzyme to kind of break down the beta bond, and uh, lactose is present in milk. And to digest milk, or another way of saying to lactose, you need an enzyme called lactase, and some people don't really have that enzyme, and that's why um, they would have issues digesting milk, because once it goes into the colon undigested, the enzymes in the colon, or the bacteria rather, in the colon will act on it and it produces uh, carbon dioxide and methane gas and that gives uh, a lot of people an upset stomach. Obviously to tackle that problem you can uh, take artificial pills that have the lactase en enzyme in them. Okay, let's talk about some polymers now. The first polymers I'm going to talk about is the amylose. So amylose is going to be a linear polymer of glucose and in this particular case it's going to have an a one alpha one to four glycosidic linkage. And if I go back uh, down here to the structure, you can kind of see it's a linear form. And uh, when I look at the linkages here, this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. And in the second glucose molecule, it's going to be one, two, three, four. So you can clearly see that this particular bond, it's going to be an alpha linkage. And that's pretty much you're going to have in an amylose. So even though it's actually a linear polymer, so it's a linear polymer just because you have like a 1-4 linkage throughout, but it kind of exists in the form of a spiral or a spring. So that's another important thing you want to keep in mind that it exists in the form of a spring. And when you run an iodine test on these uh, um, so-called starch as well, or even like the amylose, when you're running an iodine test on it, 
since it's a spring, the iodine kind of slides into the spring, and as a result, it gives them in a deep uh, blue-black color. And that tells you the presence of a uh, high amount of amylose in there, and that's what you really have in the starch, because in starch you have a good chunk of amylose, and you really don't have uh, the amylose in the glycogens, and that's how you can differ differentiate the the starch from the glycogens and even other polysaccharides. The other polysaccharides don't really give it a positive iodine test. Now, when, let's talk about this amylopactin. So it's kind of similar to the amylose. You're going to have this 1,4 uh, linkage between the glucose units. So this is the alpha 1 to 4 linkage. But then in addition to that, every 25 to 30 units of glucose, you're going to have this 1,6, this alpha 1 to 6 uh, linkage, and that's what gives it a branched polymer. So since it's a branched polymer, you don't really have the iodine fitting really well into the amylopactin, and as a result, it doesn't really give that uh, blue-black uh, blue color as the amylose gives when you're running an iodine test. Okay, so that's uh, your second polymer. The next polymer you got to worry about is the glycogen. So the glycogen is actually an energy reserve in animals. So obviously when we eat and uh, we have to store energy for the later on use, the liver and some other organs, um, including brain, they can convert the glucose into the energy reserve form, which is the glycogen. And glycogen is actually very similar to the amylopactin. So it's very branched polymer of glucose. But the difference is the, the 1 to 6 linkage is going to be after every 8 to 10 units. As opposed to an amylopactin, you can see the linkage is every 25 to 30 units. But in case of glycogen, the linkage is going to be every 8 to 10 units. So you can clearly say that glycogen is actually going to be more branched. if you're relatively comparing it with the amylopactins, amylopactin is going to be less branched compared to the glycogen. And if you having a hard time how you really got to 1 to 6 linkage here, so remember this was going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then in this uh, second uh, glucose unit on the bottom, I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So you can clearly see how this carbon 1 from the first glucose and carbon-6 from the second glucose are bonding one another, and that's what gives it an alpha 1 to 6 linkage. And remember, whether you're going to have an alpha or beta is determined by the position of your alpha, or your anomeric carbon. So since it's pointed down, which is trans to the CH2OH, that's what makes it an alpha. Okay, in addition to that, uh, the glycogen is also called an animal starch. The reason why it's really called an animal starch is because in plants, the energy reserve is going to be the starch. So the way the plant stores the energy, is, and you can talk about the grains and potatoes, they have a lot of starch in there, and that starch is used by the animals, uh, by the animals and the human beings as well. Um, but in addition to that, plants also use that starch as an energy reserve when there isn't a deficiency of sunlight or, and they can't really run the photosynthesis. Now, the starch is going to have both amylose and amylopactin in there. So that's the difference between the glycogen and the starch. The, uh, roughly, the amylose is, uh, makes anywhere 10 to 30% of the starch depending on the source of the starch if it's the you know starch could come from different sources of the plant and in that case it could have a different uh, percentages and uh, as far as the amylopactin you're going to have anywhere between 70 to 90 percent um, now starch since it includes an amylose in there when you run an iodine test for the starch it's going to give a dark blue black color and that's when you know you got you have the starch in there when you're running an iodine test on the glycogen it gives a brown blue color 
So that's how you can actually differentiate between the glycogen and the starch. So if you're given two samples and if you're asked, okay, do you, is it glycogen or a starch, you can, you can tell that by running the iodine. And you can also separate those from the rest of the polysaccharides because the rest of the polysaccharides don't really give positive iodine tests. They're going to be giving a negative iodine test and in that case the color of the iodine solution is just going to persist and the original color of the iodine solution is brown yellow. So if that doesn't really change the, uh, that means you have something else beside the glycogen and the starch. Okay, I uh, also want to talk about this next one, which is a cellulose. So cellulose is actually going to be the most abundant organic uh, compound, you can say, because it's, good, it's going to be the structural component of the plant. So you got the leaves and all that, the grass, whatnot, everything has a cellulose in there. And uh, if you take an example of cotton, cotton has almost a 95 or more than 95% of the cellulose component in there. Now, the difference between... Uh, the rest of these energy reserves that we just talked about, glycogens and starch, and the cellulose is how the bonding going to be. So even in cellulose, your monomer unit is still going to be the glucose. However, let me just move this up a little bit. However, when you look at uh, the linkage, it's actually going to be the beta linkage. So when I'm counting the carbons here, this is going to be the first one, and on the second monomer unit, this is going to be the fourth one, and since this is pointed up, another way of saying it's going to be cis with respect to the CH2OH, this is going to be beta 1,4 glycosidic bond. All right, so obviously we can't really eat grass because we don't really have enzymes to break down this uh, beta linkage. If you can somehow figure out how to break down this beta linkage, we'll have plenty of food out there in that case. And obviously animals such as cows and other cattle, they can eat a lot of grass because uh, they got a lot of bacteria in their, in their stomach that they can they can produce this enzyme that can break down these beta linkages and that gives them an energy source that gives that provides them a lot of glucose in that case um, so that's how that's all I have to say about uh, these uh, different types of polysaccharides and obviously there are tons of other polysaccharides but these are the most common ones that you're going to be uh, seeing in an introductory chemistry course and uh, if you have any questions about any of those feel free to leave any comments in the section below